Morning, everyone. This is Barry Knapp with Ironsides Macroeconomics, coming to you from sunny New Jersey at the tag ends of our whirlwind trip of three days in Boston, three days in New York City, and four days in New Jersey visiting family, friends, and uh, seeing a few clients along the way as well. We'll be back in Colorado tomorrow. We'll get back to our full publishing schedule. We did write a somewhat abbreviated note this week. Um, probably half the length of our typical notes titled Inflation, Making Sure It Does Happen Here. That was published on May 15th, two days ago. And it's a reference to former Fed Chairman Bernanke's 2002 speech before he was the Fed Chairman titled Deflation, Making Sure It Doesn't Happen Here. So it was uh, poking a bit of fun at, at the Fed and the reaction function around the shocking inflation numbers that we've been seeing as of late and last week in particular. So the structure of the report and of this podcast and video is going to be two sections. The first one was titled The Death of Price Theory. It's about the uh, market's reaction to last week's data and, uh, and of that Fed reaction function, the dichotomy between the Fed's and markets views of the inflation outlook, which is uh, fairly stark. <clears throat> and then there was a second section of the report titled the pandemic inflationary shock, where we walk through last week's inflation and employment data and what that implies for the intermediate to longer term outlook. So on the death of the price theory section, we began by saying that um, the Chicago school price theory, the idea that that ultimate price contains a tremendous amount of information. It's the sum total of millions of transactions um, around the what Hayek called the spontaneous economic order and ultimately is the most important um, conveyor of macro information. Um, with respect to antitrust theory, we're moving away from consumerism and price theory towards this idea of structuralism being big is bad in and of itself, even if there's no evidence of higher prices or price gouging, um, we should be stopping uh, and dealing with that structuralism. It's a, I suppose you could call it a little bit of uh, arrogance of policymakers that they can determine what is good and what is bad, even if there's no evidence of prices going higher. Um, and, uh, and the same holds true with a Federal Reserve that has moved from focusing on really the inflation target and the inflation portion of their mandate to being far more concerned about inclusive uh, labor measures of labor market slack. And so um, this is our idea that the whole Chicago price theory um, approach to economics and policy has been uh, completely upended. Um, and, and where we're coming from with respect to that is if you think about, we wrote a little bit about this last week and spoke about it on the podcast, if you think about the section of the treasury curve where the Fed has the most influence, which is the belly of the curve, the average duration of their purchases is six years. So if you look at, want to look at the five-year portion of the treasury curve, what you see is five-year real rates, the tips um, yield at the lowest level since those securities were introduced in the late 90s at nearly negative 2%, roughly negative 1.9% to be a little more precise. And the inflationary component of that or so-called inflation break-even uh, or differential between <clears throat> the actual five-year yield and that tips yield um, is a two and three quarter percent um, inflation break even or expectations of inflation over the next five years at the highest level since 2005 and just below its all time highest level for five year inflation expectations or inflation break evens. Um, that's that dichotomy that we referred to a few minutes ago between the market's view of what's going to happen to inflation over the next five years and the Fed's view, because the Fed is really the pro uh, proximate cause for that real rate being as low as it is through all of their asset purchases. Um, what also happened last week with respect or in reaction to the inflation numbers was 
the longer term inflation expectations really started to move as well. So we look at the five year, five year forward, which is really inflation from year six through 10. And that moved uh, substantially higher last week, 12 basis points or so, and is now well through the Fed's um, inflation target adjusted for the differential between CPI and, and uh, core PCED, which is what the Fed targets. Um, you're still well through the Fed's target there. So we're already in the overshoot uh, stage of the recovery, which the Fed said they were going to do. It's a question of how long can they hold on with all of this. So keep in mind, as we keep saying, we have moved from a disinflationary regime to a reflationary regime. You don't go straight to inflation where all sorts of insidious things happen like we learned about in textbooks. And when I was studying economics back in the early 80s, we have to go through the reflation stage of the cycle first. That reflationary stage is surely bad for bond uh, holders, but um, is not so bad for equity holders as you get operating leverage from getting stronger revenue growth, which allows your margins relative to your fixed costs to start to widen out, particularly for um, more cyclically oriented companies. So this means, you know, sticking with financials, sticking with industrials, sticking with materials, energy stocks, um, technology, uh, you know, is being tossed um, away to some extent these days. There are cyclical elements to technology to be sure. So for example, we think you're going to get a very robust recovery in uh, software investment and technology products in 2021 as we recover from the double dip recession in capital spending uh, that occurred as a consequence first from the trade war and then the pandemic. So there will be cyclical elements. No, we would not be buying the high multiple technology stocks that so-called duration effect from uh, rates trending, tending or trending higher, um, but we would be in, you know, more cyclically oriented technology sectors, semis, and even software, which in some cases is expensive, but not in all cases, um, we would be uh, we would be still not underweight those sectors, market weight. They've performed poorly, but we're looking for a little bit of a rebound in uh, in the um, in the tech sector. Um, again, no change in our sector weightings. We're going to stick with market weight, but if you've drifted underweight in your holdings, we would suggest getting back to market weight here. So that's it on the price theory. Going back through the data that occurred last week, we think is, is pretty important stuff. We did a probably a little more uh, data review than we typically would in our notes. Uh, this is the what we've been describing as the pandemic inflationary shock, right? So the global financial crisis was a disinflationary shock. There's all sorts of academic literature about how the most persistent effect from a financial crisis is a decade of disinflation. That was one of the contributing factors to last cycle's uh, disinflation. This was not a financial crisis. This was a pandemic, a, almost a natural disaster type event, sudden stop economy. We're getting a really obviously very robust recovery. This had far more inflationary uh, implications to it. And um, that seems to be a little misunderstood by uh, Fed officials and, and a lot of market participants. So um, the Fed keeps lecturing us about the base effects from uh, the um, pandemic. But if you look at quarter on quarter annualized CPI, it's at 5.6% for the core. Um, so that has no base effect. That's just the strong impulse from reopening. And when we look through the components of that, there were clearly some transitory price gains there, lodging away from home, the fuels and utility uh, numbers that we saw, used car prices and airfares all spiked. We would fully uh, grant that those are likely transitory. But then there's other stuff that's not transitory. Housing related measures are just starting to pick up. Um, if you look at our house price index versus CPI shelter, you see the early stages of a recovery in CPI shelter, which will likely persist for some time. And um, the housing effect is not transitory. We believe this is going to be a very strong cycle for household formations and demand for housing. And you really have to ask yourself, why is the Fed buying 100% of net supply of mortgage-backed securities and adding uh, what we think is a counterproductive um, 
impulse into the economy because it is crowding out natural buyers, bringing financial buyers into the housing sector. And um, we don't want to turn it turn it around and for the Fed to wind up being restrictive, but we'd like to see them cool that off a little bit and, and reduce their mortgage-backed securities purchases. And then there's a number, number of other categories within CPI that haven't even begun to recover yet. Um, medical care is a great example that it still looks depressed from the effects of the pandemic, what it meant for other port, parts of medicine away from the COVID pandemic itself. Um, and expectations are starting to move higher. You saw in the University of Michigan um, May survey released on Friday morning that um, one year inflation expectations from the public moved up from 3.4% to 4.6% and five year expectations moved from 2.7 to 3.1. So the expectations arguably are beginning to be somewhat embedded in the public psyche. Um, and that's obviously something that um, bears, uh, bears consideration. PPI um, related measures released the day after CPI <clears throat> showed that the um, intermediate prices for consumer goods are just starting to recover from, again, a double dip recession related to the global or the trade war, as well as the pandemic. Um, and import prices are picking up. And if you think about the long-term outlook for import prices, um, back to our 60s analog and, and uh, Kennedy and Johnson administrations that become became a little less interested in being good stewards of the dollar gold standard. We think the same will be true of um, the Biden administration and the country at large. And the dollar is likely to be, this is likely to be a weaker dollar um, business cycle in our view. So you could have import price inflation can, uh, you know, continue through the cycle additionally, because we just don't think you're going to get um, uh, the same level of globalization, expansion of globalization, this cycle that you've had in, in uh, certainly in the 2000s and probably in the 2010s as well. So again, that stuff is not all transitory. Um, it's likely to persist. And then finally, on the labor market, we, we received the JOLT survey last week, which showed Big headline was all the job openings, but um, when you look through the data, it's it's pretty clear that the labor market, using our labor market slack ind indicator, is um, not all that much slack. We're at 2007, mid 2017 levels of labor market slack. This is why wages never fell during the pandemic, and they're likely to be under upward pressure. Last week's claims numbers um, continued the same trend we've written quite a bit about, which is that initial claims. Um, have plunged, so there's very little in the way of layoffs, but um, continuing claims have remained at 16 million where they've been all year, largely because of a series of factors, for, first and foremost, or the one that policymakers could uh, react to would be this expansion, $300 additional um, of unemployment insurance per week, which should be ended in June, not September. That would help get the labor market going. But bottom line is the labor market is weak or is, is um, the labor market slack is, uh, is not really relevant. Wages are likely to um, be under upward pressure. And again, that creates more of an inflationary impulse. So on balance, um, this was last week was not a good week for uh, the Fed in particular. We are firmly into a reflationary environment and um, <clears throat> they're going to do everything they can do to hang on to current policy settings. But uh, the pressure is going to build on them, um, you know, in particular when we get to the next round of inflation data. But um, but the labor market data is showing similar evidence. So stick with your reflation um, plays. Stick with those equity market sectors that benefit from that and um, um, stay away from the bond market. Um, uh, there will be a day of reckoning for all this. We continue to think that Jackson Hole was probably when the Fed will start the process of uh, weakening that impulse or talking about to begin talking about talking about tapering. But between now and then, we say no reason why those reflation plays wouldn't continue to work. Um, that's it for me this week. Barry Knapp from Ironsides Macro. Um, if you're not already a subscriber to our podcast or 
uh, have subscribed to our YouTube video channel, please do so. You can see this video, video also it gets produced by Nucleus 195. Um, and uh, also be consider become a, becoming a subscriber to our written research reports that come out every Saturday morning and a few odds and ends along the way. So Barry Knapp Ironsides, have a good week, everyone. Thank you.